Because the way in which I got involved in this was I mentioned my innovation study, where I visited did a number of schools, innovative schools. That's actually part of my own personal professional development plan. My goal is to visit at least five innovative schools every year and spend one, two, or three days interviewing, visiting, hanging out with them, asking questions. And I like to visit the extremes. I don't want to visit a school that just has a really neat activity in this class. I want to see schools that are just stepping outside the box, even if it's not highly effective. <laughs> For example, I've visited schools that are um, direct instruction schools, where every teacher gets a script and they can't deviate from it, and they're supposed to read it at a certain pace. Uh, that is an innovation of sorts. But I visited a lot of different schools. I'm starting to visit higher education institutions as well. Um, I hope to go out east and visit some of their very distinct schools. Antioch College is one I want to visit, our work study school. But on the K-12 world, I've spent a lot of time in Wisconsin in what we what are considered to be part of our charter school system, because that's where we see a lot of innovations. You may or may not know that the charter school initiative first started as an effort to try out innovations and to learn what works and what doesn't very quickly. And if it doesn't work, close it and get the students in a healthier school environment. And if it does work, keep it going and replicate it. But many people critique the charter school system because they forgot that last part. They got it going, and whether or not it worked, they just kept them going. And students may or may not be learning. So charter schools, depending upon what state I'm in, they have a, a good or bad rap because of, uh, sometimes they let a lot of schools continue going that, that aren't that effective. So I, I'm visiting all these schools, and I, I ran into a lot of project-based learning schools because I was intrigued by the level of motivation and self-direction and engagement that I saw from the learners. And these were not necessarily your honors students or the students gravitating toward the AP courses. In fact, in some of these schools, they largely weren't those students because those students wanted their AP credits. So they were staying in the traditional uh, school format in order to get those advanced, uh, the advanced credits for college. So sometimes these were students um, probably similar to how I saw myself as a, as a high school student. Very curious, very interested, uh, but lacking in some skill and, and the ability to think strategically and with precision about things. So um, that's what I saw here. Then at the same time, I started to have a conversation with one of the English, English faculty members at our university who um, was not necessarily a big advocate of technology. He loves books. The book is still my favorite technology, by the way. He loves books, and he said, I have just haven't found a great replacement for the old school note card. If you can find, fun, find one for me, I'm willing to try it out. And I introduced him to the word pilot which is an excuse for trying anything for a while without accountability. So, <laughs> with men less accountability, so it seems. And, uh, and so, uh, we talked about this. I don't know if he actually has piloted this, but I considered that a challenge, and I started exploring and looking for alternatives to note cards. You put those two together, and I started to see how um, some new digital tools can serve in project-based learning environments. So, here's a quick video just to introduce you to the concept of project-based learning. You remember what it was like in school. It was boring. You sat in class, memorized as much as you could, and tried to pass a test at the end. But is that good enough? These days, school can be more interesting and effective by focusing students on work that matters. This is project-based learning. This, is gonna, uh, this video introduces people to a particular model of project-based learning, and it's my favorite model, probably just because I've gotten comfortable with it, and it comes from the Buck Institute, B-I-E dot org. And what the Buck Institute does, my favorite part, is they give you these wonderful templates for building a project-based learning experience. So here's an example, and this is a little, may be a little bit hard to see from the back, but here's an example of a project-based learning template from the Buck Institute. It's kind of like a lesson plan template, and I used it for a number of projects early on until I got comfortable, and then I sort of skipped steps here and there. But the first thing you do at the top is you put the name of the project. You'll see this one, it's called Projectile Motion. The duration of the project, estimated two weeks, 
typical project-based learning it usually takes about two weeks at least to get it going and to do it effectively. So two to three weeks is the time period that I see. So when you think about designing a project-based learning lesson, it's more like a unit plan typically than a lesson plan. The subject is math, grade level 11, um, other subject areas to be included, physics. So the project idea, let me zoom in here. What the project idea is, is you write up just a quick, a quick um, summary of what you're going to be doing. Oops, I made it too large. So, students work in teams to design and construct a ballistic device that launches an object in a flight path that follows a parabola. And uh, they go on and explain it. it. After that, they list what the students will be able to do, and they align it with the content standards. Then, underneath that, th this particular model tries to align it with 21st century skills. Any of you use the 21st century skills from it's the partnership for 21st century skills? It's a set of skills that are identified as critical for succeeding today. Things like collaboration skills, presentation skills, critical thinking. So this just allows you to identify specific skills that are taught as part of the lesson. And you can say they're taught and assessed, or they're exposed to them. What level? Then you talk about, OK, in a project-based learning environment, you're assessing students based upon products or performances. So you're going to figure out what they're learning because they're going to produce something that demonstrates their understandings or lack thereof, right? So this is where you write out what kinds of products they'll be producing. Some of them may be products along the way that become checkpoints for you to see how they're doing and for them to see how they're doing. That's pretty humane. You know, it's a lot more humane than having one culminating project at the end and the first time they get feedback from you is when they submit it. And if they're way off, then not a very pleasant experience for them. And they lose a chance to learn from it. So then you usually want group and individual projects. I find that a lot of teachers who haven't taught project-based learning, they're most comfortable with group products along the way, and then a couple of individual products to make sure that they understand basic things. And then an individual project at the end that they use for a grade. At least when I work with middle school and high school teachers, that's what they're most comfortable with. Now. Um, the audience, the idea behind project-based learning is that the students are creating some kind of product that's authentic. And in order to make them, have them experience it as authentic, they can present their work to an audience beyond their peers in the class and the teacher. That's what many people would argue. So can I have them present it to a panel of experts in the community related to that topic? Can I have them pre presented to family members at some special event that's coming up in the school? How can I have them share it? Can I have them disseminate it online and then open it up for feedback from people? So that's where people use things like blogs or wikis to post their products. Then we go into my favorite part, the entry event. This is where you plan out the first day for the project. So here, it's uh, a wad tossing contest to kind of introduce them to the idea. For those of us who grew up uh, and went through teacher ed programs a while ago, you would call this your anticipatory set, your hook, your introduction, whatever you want to call it. And you build in here, how am I going to assess their learning along the way? What kinds of quizzes, journals? It gives you different options. You can add your own. Then you list out what resources you need to do the project. and. You uh, include an opportunity for them to reflect upon their learning. Maybe you can have them journal along the way. This is where people use digital tools like a, a blog, and students have to reflect about what they're learning throughout. And they can see each other's experiences and share them with one another. Sometimes if you have a learning management system like Moodle or Sakai or Blackboard or whatever your school or school district may or may not have, um, you can have, use online discussions for this. Then there's a part here, and this is a part that really makes project-based learning more effective. A lot of times, teachers say, I'm going to do project-based learning. So they come in, and they have a big entry event. It's the party day, where they introduce the concept. And they say, OK, here are the criteria for the project. Ready? Go! <laughs> and they go, and then on the last day, the students come back together, and the projects are of minimal quality, and the teacher is saying, I'm never going to do this again. It doesn't work. Well, oftentimes, it doesn't work because they didn't do this part. 
one of the things that you want to do when you first build a project is say, okay, well, what competencies, what skill, what knowledge will students need in order to be successful at this project? Well, they're going to need to know a little bit about this concept, this concept, they're going to have to be able to write, they're going to have to be able to research, and that's where you plan out how you're going to help them learn those things. You may actually have little recorded videos that are pre-recorded and they're in a little center or station that students can go and review at will. You may actually have a lecture for 15 or 20 minutes several times throughout the project to help them catch up. You, you could, you could have, that's where you plan these individual units of instruction that help them um, build and scaffold toward that final project. Then you build out your schedule, your calendar, day by day, what's going to happen each day. And that's it. So you can get this template for free through bie.org. I think you have to create a, an account. And you can log in. They have sample templates like this filled out for you, and you can download it. So if you're new to project-based learning, and you just need to kind of get a feel for how it works, that is an excellent source. The Buck Institute also has a number of um, videos that describe cases from classrooms where people use project-based learning. So project-based learning, a model that organizes learning around projects. That's my favorite definition. It's pretty straightforward. So everything that I shared with you, this is a way of designing it systematically, making sure that it goes as best as possible. But I'm pretty informal in the way that I define it. I'll skip these other definitions. So five reasons to consider it. One, we find that it allows students to really focus upon deep learning. Here's the affordance and, lim the affordance and limitation. It's depth over breadth. The limitation, they miss out on breadth with these uh, projects. So sometimes they know a lot about what they did their project on, but not necessarily the stuff around it. So teachers have to make some strategic decisions about when you think that's appropriate or not. Now the project-based learning schools that I visit, they insist that they can get breadth by doing a series of projects. For example, one school does not have a required history course for high school, and yet all of the students perform above average on the social studies part of the assessment that's required in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and so they're saying, I don't know how they learn it, but they seem to be learning it somehow amid the projects. Some of us aren't quite so comfortable with that messiness. Uh, the second one is transfer. There's an increased capacity to apply the knowledge. Because it's such a real world project or experience, they can transfer it pretty easily to a real world environment. As opposed to learning something like a, a concept that you do a, a work problem on a piece of paper, but you've never really seen how that works in the real world, that's harder. Sometimes people just don't make those connections. Third, increased student engagement and satisfaction, if done well. Students learn to think about learning, think about thinking throughout this, and it frees the instructor up for mass customization. If you're not standing up here like I am, now you can walk around and work with small groups and individuals. Now, the, the funny thing about this is this model really isn't that much different. Some of you in here may be early childhood and you're saying, well, I kind of do this all the time. I call them centers um, and they're building projects. So in, in some ways, I think one way that we can improve the educational system at large all the way through higher education is just have all of our teachers spend a couple of weeks in centers in the early childhood center. I'm totally serious. I've visited some and I, I, they're fun for me. I wish I could go back to school. Uh, Ten attributes of a great project. I think I'm going to skip over those. Just very quickly, one, learning objective. So what do you want them to learn? Sometimes people use endure, essential questions. I love these provocative questions that if you could answer it, it would demonstrate a deep knowledge. So for example, if you're a physics teacher, why do some things fly and others not? That's so much more engaging than if you were to write it out in a learning objective. Why do some things fly and others not? Or if you're a history teacher, what happens when people are ignorant about past wars? Does that impact people's contribution to society or not? Those kinds of questions can lead to some deep, deep learning. That's where you get the driving question. Should be rooted in an authentic project, connected to a learning objective, be a source of keeping the people in the project <coughs> focused, evoke interest and curiosity. 
I, by the way, just ran my first full project-based learning course on the university level uh, with a group of teachers. And they had to do a series of six projects over the course of the semester. It was phenomenal to see their learning. There were actually three learning objectives that hardly anyone met in the course that I had stated in the syllabus. Now, that was the depth over breadth thing. <laughs> but the things that they did learn stuck. And they're going to be great for their first uh, interviews, too. <laughs> uh, brief overview, description, the culminating product. This is just a review of what we saw in that outline. Uh, formative assessment, so making sure that we're doing checks along the way. That's the humane thing to do. Summative assessments, that's at the end, the projects. A list of resources, again, this is all re repeat. Planned opportunities for reflect reflection, detailed list of knowledge, and a timeline. All right, now. Let's uh, go ahead and let me show you one of these in action, and then I'll begin to demonstrate how the digital tools can come in. Let's see, should I frame this? No. Disney World makes everyone happy, leading them into somewhat unrealistic magic and helping them create new memories. If you are planning a trip anytime soon, Listen to these tips on how to make the most of your vacation. Of course, when you plan a trip, you have to think of the necessities, food, and shelter resorts. All of the hotels on Disney property have the greatest themes, but my favorite theme there is the Mardi Gras, the Big Easy, and all the happenings that take place in New Orleans. This resort is called the Port Orleans Resort, and in my view, it is the best one in the world. Moving on to restaurants, which are scattered all over the world, we have many cuisines my top favorite though is Tepon Ido, one of the Japanese restaurants where the chefs cook right in front of you. Which will you choose? The must-dos of Disney are simple. Pick the thrills and the classics. My favorite ride from the Magic Kingdom is probably Jungle Cruise. Think the animals look real? They're not. My favorite attraction in Epcot is the World Showcase, particularly free. For Hollywood Studios, you must see the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular. Next, with Animal Kingdom, you... Okay, I'm gonna stop, uh, just stop it right there. And now I'll give you a little bit of background of how this came to be. Now, the culminating project, you could argue that it's of good quality, medium quality, whatever. You might have different opinions about it. But let me tell you about what happened and why this becomes so powerful. So one of the things that I try to do each year is volunteer my services to a teacher to be a teaching and learning coach, just to keep myself in the K-12 world a little bit because I'm in higher education. And I usually do it for a unit level experience. And um, it's free of charge. I just go in and they get a free teaching aid for a unit. And I'll go in and we'll sit down and we'll brainstorm for about a month and we'll plan out the unit before we put it into, into effect. This is a particular one where there was a teacher who wanted to explore the use of digital storytelling. Now, when I first met with this teacher, she was thinking a lot about the technology, about what tool, what software can I use for creating a digital story. She was very much focused on the technique um, of using the tool or the selection of tools. So I sat down and I said, well, what do you want them to learn out of this? Well, I don't know. I just want to do digital storytelling somehow because I think it'd be great for the students. Well, it's good. It's valuable. I said, well, what are you teaching right now in language arts? Well, we have an expository essay unit that's coming up soon. We, use, we teach the six traits of writing. I'm going to be emphasizing these two traits for this particular um, unit. And, um, and I said, OK, well, let's do this. Let's have uh, you go ahead and teach that, but condense your unit. Are you able to teach it in half the time that you usually do? And she said, well, that's kind of, <laughs> that's a tough one, but I'll give it my best shot. So she had them work on it, and they wrote, uh, they got a draft of this expository essay. And they did some wonderful peer editing and things like that. And the only thing they were using in terms of technology largely was they were using a word processor, and they had a shared folder where they could save their documents and give each other feedback. So that, that's kind of nice. Many of your schools may use Google Docs as a way to do that. It's a great way where students can upload their document, they can share it with their other um, classmates, and they can give comments on one another. You can do a lot of peer editing. So that's all that they did. But then we went the next step. So how can we get the students to really attend to their essays? 
to edit them with a level of care and precision that they typically wouldn't. It's hard to get students to do draft after draft after draft after draft. Um, but, uh, but there's benefit to them. How do we benefit to that? How do we get them to experience that benefit? So we came up with the idea of a digital story that was going to be built upon the expository essay. We talked about the idea of students doing group projects, but then we decided, no, we wanted every student to take ownership for their own individual project. So every student wrote their expository essay, they got it ready. And then we had a plan. It was pretty simple. We wanted to outsource some of the work for this. So we found a forensics coach who was going to come in and lead a session on the power of the spoken word we found a musician to come in and talk about the way in which music can enhance the spoken word. And then we had a photographer come in and talk about the ways in which images can help enhance messages. So they had their expository essay. And the students, on the, on the first day, the students came in. I forget which order we needed here. Um, I think it was a forensics coach, but I, I think I'm wrong. Doesn't matter too much. So the forensics coach comes in and talks about the power of the spoken word, and he does this great job. He's a forensics coach, after all, so he can speak rather well. And he talks about the way in which you speak, if you speak quickly or slowly, about your cadence. He talks about the monotone and how that can impact the message. And I'm talking too fast, can also impact the message. And then he has the students practice. They all had downloaded onto their computer a free copy of Audacity. You can get look search for it online if you have Microsoft Word. If you have a Mac, you actually have software that is built right into the Mac that you can use. Lots of pieces of software for this. And they simply practiced reciting their expository essay. Now notice, they're reciting their essay. By reciting their essay, they're reviewing the content of their essay. And the moment that they start speaking it out loud, they notice things that they want to change. So they begin to revise their essay and improve upon the previous draft, what they thought was pretty much their final draft. And then you hear students that, by the way, Aki was designing an environment that sort of promoted collaboration. So she had tables that were two square tables, and the students had a laptop cart, so they all had their laptops, and they could see each other eye to eye. And you'd see students when they're recording with their headsets, and it's amazing to hear a group of fourth graders talk to each other and say, I don't know if I enunciated that um, quite the way that I should have. Or uh, th they're using this language that was introduced to them, this discourse introduced to them by the, the forensics coach. And they start giving each other feedback. Would you listen to this? Could you give me some, what do you think about this? Oh, I think that's a little too fast. I think it'd be more effective if you sort of pause here. And then maybe when we get to the image part, they know it's coming. We could have an image just to speak that would speak for you. So you hear this wonderful discourse. Students are editing their work. They're doing more peer editing. It's the exact same expository essay. Then we bring in the, um, where am I at? So we have the photographer, the, or the forensics coach. OK. Then we have, I think we've got the musician next. Then we have the musician come in and talk about how music can detract or enhance. There's, there's an old song I always think of. I don't share it with the young people, but it was a, an old song by, I forget, it was a group like, it wasn't Depeche Mode, it was some group like from the 80s or 90s, but it was called Girlfriend in a Coma. <laughs> and it was this song, it's like you're dancing around the room, but it's about your girlfriend in a coma. And it's sort of, you know, the, the part that people thought was funny about the song, I guess, was that the, the tune communicated one message, but the words were somber. You know, girlfriend in a coma, I know, I know it's serious. It's <laughs> crazy, right? So the teacher didn't use that example, but she used other examples of how you have music behind spoken words and how the music can change the way that people experience the very same words. And she came up with some great examples, some great ideas, and then she had preloaded, because of time and copyright, she had preloaded a series of 15 or 20 um, wordless sound clips or music clips of jazz and classical and, and different things like that so that students could go onto their laptops and they could try out different background music on their expository essay. Once again, that's what happened. They started playing, there were some technical issues, but the teacher and I as the coach or as the teacher's aide could walk around and fix those one at a time while others worked. And they were just they were really grappling with, oh this doesn't quite 
get at the essence of what I want to say. I don't know if they use the word essence, but that was kind of how they spoke. It was amazing. They're also, by the way, articulating things verbally in ways that they hadn't been used to. Remember in the keynote, I talked about Germanic and Latinic? They were actually using a kind of Latin discourse about their writing in a way that they maybe hadn't done very much before. And then finally, the last piece, oh, well, actually, we, they did get to play around with using words. But largely, we showed, decided to not use video to get very straightforward. So spoken word and images and music. So then the last thing we did was we had a photographer come in. And the students could take pictures, or they could go on the web, and we showed them how to limit your Google search to only the ones that are free to use. I don't know if you've ever done that. There's an advanced search in Google. Click on images. There's a way to say, only give me the ones that are free to reuse. Um, and they looked for images to highlight key concepts. So you saw this example here. The best ones, in my opinion, were where students took pictures and they didn't find a perfect picture, so they had others kind of act and pose to illustrate ideas. And they took the pictures and then they inserted them and then they put it all together as a digital story. Now for the culminating part. The final piece was, this was for, at a private Lutheran school, and Lutheran schools have an annual practice every year of Lutheran Schools Week. And they celebrate the value of Lutheran schools and everything. And oftentimes they get family involved. So in this school, they had a grandparents day. Mm -hmm. So the kids put together a film festival for grandparents day. The grandparents came and they watched. Not only did the kids get, get the affirmation from their grandparents and from this public performance, they took great pride in making things just right because it was going to be a public performance. And they had to introduce their video and all, you know, they walked through this. But they even got a few donations for the, the school <laughs> out of this. <laughs> so it actually became a promotional piece for the school. And uh, that teacher continued to use this model, she does it to, to this day. Now they're moving to an iPad initiative, and you can do everything I described with free software on the iPad, but you're missing that presentation right now, sorry. Um, <laughs> there's one on the iPad. I think the PowerPoint will be uploaded. Uh, there's another example of the digital storytelling. So here's a way that we did it. Started with pre-existing lesson, added expert visits to reduce the amount of time and energy for all of the content creation, because these projects can be time intensive. If someone else already has the expertise, use it. Bring in guest speakers. All you need is a computer with internet access and Skype. If any of you have, uh, haven't used Skype, ask me, I can help you out there. But Skype, and now you can literally conference call anyone in as an expert. You can email the world and find an expert. Here's my favorite part of guest speakers through Skype when you're doing project-based learning. This is one of, that's one of the collaboration tools I was mentioning. When you have guest speakers, you feel obligated to give them the whole time, oftentimes, don't you? I mean, after all, they came in, they set aside work or whatever else it was, so you give them as much time. On Skype, you can just say, I want your best 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, bye, and hang up, and then you have the rest of the class period for whatever you need and want with the students. And there are some tools, I use a program called Pamela that allows me to record my Skype sessions. So now you can record these and students can go and revisit these artifacts that are built. But we actually had live people come in and it was very dynamic and participatory and interactive, so I wouldn't have replaced that part. We created rubrics based upon the feedback. So we didn't know exactly, it wasn't quite as planned out as maybe we wanted, so the teacher took notes when the presenter was speaking and then based, created a rubric on the five or six main points that she wanted to highlight. And those rubrics were used to assess the project. Students did some peer assessing. Cafe-style classroom was key to this environment, where students had a chance to interact, where the space was conducive to collaborating. And a collaborative creation of a content repository for the, the project, so there was a common place where they could store their, store their stuff. Uh, you didn't have to mess around with going and finding the music. It had all been stored in a file in advance, which reduced the time. That's one of the big problems, is the um, early PowerPoint effect. How many of you fell prey to this, or maybe you still do, if you're putting together a PowerPoint, and you have uh, some ideas, but you spend 90% of your time finding just the right image <laughs> to illustrate your idea, right? And that can happen with these sorts of projects as well. So sometimes teachers will pre-select 
a collection of images or we'll have students take the pictures themselves and you have to limit the time so that just doesn't get overblown. It's just the reality of a, a regular school environment. And yeah, I think it's very appropriate depending on what age they're at. If the newer students are to this, the more you want to restrict, the, the, the stricter you might want the boundaries early on until they get comfortable with the idea of a project. So you maybe start with a small number of images and music clips, and uh, maybe you even give them all a common project. Once they get comfortable with the technical part of it, the process, then you can expand it to a bigger project like this. We got lucky, it worked well the first time. Uh, and we have the final performance, Grandparents Day. So what's different about this kind of work and this kind of research? Just want to have us talk about that for a moment, and then we'll move on to some of the tools. As you think about it, I mentioned depth versus breadth, but what else strikes you? How about the ways in which students interact? How is it similar to or different from other kinds of learning environments that you've seen? More collaborative. OK. Collaborative. <coughs> so it's collaborative without cooperative learning. So many of us grew up with this idea of cooperative learning. We have very strict assigned roles for everyone. This oftentimes doesn't have very strict assigned roles. You can do it that way. But uh, sometimes you have a person playing multiple roles, but it's still very, it's kind of organic in the way that people collaborate, but with still very clear outcomes and goals in mind. Other things that catch your attention about what's different. The nature of reflection on the part of the student and the teacher too is very different. Yeah, yes. So there, there's a lot of reflection and the, the nature of it is different. And it's very task oriented. So there's a lot of discourse. I mentioned that Germanic Latin at discourse. There's a lot of Latin at discourse. They're learning to talk, um, have intellectual discourse about ideas and projects and, and concepts. And if you, do, if you did a discourse analysis of a typical classroom, just transcribed all the discourse that's taking place, you videotaped it and you watched, in many traditional teaching and learning structures and environments, you don't see students engaging in a lot of that. Instead, you see a lot of question and answer exchange in many classroom environments. But here, you're seeing students take the lead on an initiative and give each other feedback on it. That's quite authentic and very similar to the kinds of uh, tasks that people have to do in um, knowledge age work environments. Yes? To some extent, there's more options for students pick a topic of interest to them, so you, I would think you'd have higher motivation. Uh, yes, so there's select, they have more choice, and so you can sometimes get more motivation with that. Also, notice how the teacher, I didn't show you the other examples, but how the teacher can differentiate without labeling. So you can customize these learning experiences for individual learners, and guide them, and direct them, and coach them. And it doesn't seem like you're pointing them out as the slow student or um, whatever else it might be. But they are seeing each other's work still. And they're learning from the, the um, others. OK, so what skills are required? I think we, still, we talked about that a little bit. But I'll share some that I think are kind of fun that you don't see. Uh, I love this first one. We're in the collaborative digital age, and I am absolutely convinced that one of the skills we want to make sure we teach is the ability to work entirely alone at times. Sometimes you just have to hide and work on something for a while. But then, work in diverse teams. And there isn't a whole lot of direction. There's direction on the task, but not on the rules of interaction. Except that we have to be fair and kind and polite and try to give substantive feedback, something like that. But it's not nearly as directed and structured as some of the other kinds of collaborative environments we've used in the past. Uh, collaborative across networks with limited face-to-face -face interaction. In some cases, you can, uh, I actually do project-based learning in online courses, where students are doing the same thing, but they never see each other in person. And there are high school online courses. I'm in a state that has, I think, 18 um, online K-12 schools that are running public schools. So people are doing some of this. Uh, build upon data collection, transmedia navigation. I'm going to skip right now. That's a whole other. Henry Jenkins, if you like. If that just is an intriguing phrase for you. <laughs> Search for Henry Jenkins. You'll find plenty. Um, edit the work of others. Organize research findings in meaningful ways beyond their individual preferences. Okay, so tips for creating this. 
If you are in a position to try to affect a large group of people and you'd like to see them embrace and try this out, one would be to help students and teachers get informed about the possibilities. But, and this is what I consider to be a really effective strategy when I'm coaching um, teachers, build upon pre-existing classroom practices. So instead of Howard Gardner, who many of us know for multiple intelligences, but he has another book that I love about changing minds, how to change your own and others. And he talks about how he uses his background as a cognitive psychologist to think about how to influence others. And he talks a lot about redescription. It's much easier for me to agree and redirect than to disagree and try to get them to start from scratch with me. So, um, for example, someone may say to you, uh, I don't like chocolate cake. And you say, um, you know, there are a lot of chocolate cakes that I don't like either. What kinds of chocolate cakes don't you like? Are there any kinds that you do like? Or what are the parts that you like about chocolate cake? And so you at least focus on the cake part, and you redefine it or reframe it. Um, and the same thing can happen in classroom practices. So I don't like this flimsy, fluffy, um, project-based learning stuff. OK, get rid of the definition. Let's start with what you like. In this case, the teacher was very uh, interested. But we started with a pre-existing lesson. We did not throw up her expository essay lesson. We started with it, we built on it, and all she needed to do, and this was no small matter, is find an extra week and a half <laughs> for us to add this component. So she did have to cut back on some other lessons in different places in the semester. That's the Faustian bargain involved in this depth of her breath um, challenge. So four baby steps. One thing that I like to do to get people ready and to get students primed and ready for this uh, is doing pieces of even traditional papers and projects together. Now, those of you working with the younger grades, some of this might not be quite as applicable, but there are a lot of social tools. How many of you use Google Docs? Okay, so Google Docs, you can create a free account. Just go to google.com, you can create an account, or docs.google.com, and you can create a free account. Google Docs is sort of a cloud-based, a series of work of, of tools, um, productivity tools. You have like the equivalent of Microsoft Excel and um, Microsoft PowerPoint, the equivalent of Microsoft Word, and this is the equivalent of Microsoft Excel. But here is an example of a collected or annotated bibliography. All that I did is I went in here and I created a column called topic, key phrase, a column called name of news story, publication date link to source, three to five sentence summary, and then you can have a column with name as well if you want, and people can identify their name, but you can look that up behind the scenes. So this is a document, and you can give multiple groups of students access to it. They all, can all go in and edit it, so everyone can collectively edit the same document, which means they could delete things too. So you, you can go back to old versions. And basically what I wanted to do here is this was a course, this was actually a graduate course, on cyber ethics that I teach. And I wanted them to begin to surface some of the ethical dilemmas and challenges of the digital world. Instead of them writing small group, doing small group projects or individual essays to, to gradually move them into this project-based learning with digital tools, uh, what I had them do, we wanted to expedite the process, is they all had the task of finding three news articles about people who got fired or in trouble because of things that they did online during the work day or after work. And they just had to put the news story, the publication date, a link to it, and an annotation, three to five sentences. So as a group, we collectively, in a matter of days, had a bibliography of 20 news sources on this subject. Then we just went to a traditional research project, but they all used the same collection of sources and they wrote individual um, projects. So it was a way for me to begin to introduce them to the notion of collaboration. Then later, when we got into project-based learning units, I had this in their toolbox, and they learned to collaborate and share resources that would relate. So you can have maybe four students working on a project with a similar topic, and they could use a Google Doc to share resources with one another. They knew how to go in and comment on, on the document, because if you go into Google Docs, you can go here and insert, uh, comment, so they were ready to do 
here editing one another's work. So it's a nice small one. Another one you can do is the Google Doc, the uh, Word version. I have students oftentimes, oftentimes do what I call collective essays. Have any of you ever done a collective essay before? A collective essay is an essay written by everyone and no one. It's the, it's the spirit of the wiki. So if you go to Wikipedia and you read an article, in many cases, that article was not written by a single person, and most of us never recognize who contributed to it. You can't look behind the scenes and find out in some cases, but um, everyone kind of contributed to the article or the resource. You can use a Google Doc where you give the students an assignment, it's basically a paper like you would assign to an individual student, but the whole group, just in whatever format they want, they have three days to write the essay. So I can actually have a group of students write an eight to 10 page essay in Google Docs on a given topic. And then that essay is a resource for the project that I actually write. They're still gonna be held individually accountable. So the students contribute to this essay because it's gonna help them be successful in the next assignment or the next project. That makes sense? Let me stop there. Any questions or thoughts about that? <coughs> Another one that you may be interested in as well is uh, social bookmarking. How many of you use social bookmarking? Digo is my favorite. Favorite. What do you guys like? Anyone else have a different one? So diigo.com. If any of you are still using your web browser and you go up to favorites and you add favorites and you have this big long collection of links, you might want to explore creating a Digo account. You can even add a little button that will pop up in your browser. That way, when you see something you like, you can add it, you can put it in all sorts of different categories, you can put keywords attached to it, and it's stored on the web. You can make it public for others to view, or you can make it private so only you see it. That way, any computer you're at, wherever you are, you can, you can make use of the resources. Now, for the sake of projects, you can have a group of students who are collectively adding resources on a given topic in one common place, and then they can all use those resources for the next step of the project works very well. Um, okay. So what I would, what I often try to do when working with teachers is to get them to build um, a set of supported tools, but just not to let the tools rule the project, right? So you may have Google Docs, you may have Digo, you may have identified a couple of tools for creating video, you may have other sources as well. Um, Oh yeah, we have online participants who can type in. Please let me know if you see anything there. But you have this toolbox at your disposal that you can pull out. Here are a few others that I found useful. I mentioned Google Docs and Digo. Noodle Tools, any of your school districts use Noodle Tools? Noodle Tools is a, a digital replacement for note cards, basically. It does have a fee to it. I think you have a, a version you can do for free. but. Um, it allows you to take digital note cards, and here's the cool part though. The digital note cards, you can actually put multiple stacks. That was the real limitation of the old school note card, right? You would put um, a category for it, but then when I started organizing my collection of 100 note cards, one note card can only go in one stack. With uh, Noodle tools, you can write these digital note cards, and I can take this same card and it can show up digitally in multiple categories. I like that a lot, it works well. And it has all of your bibliographic data stored in there. Uh, Evernote is another one that some people use that's kind of in some ways Noodle tools light. I use Evernote to take notes for all of my meetings now. It's basically a digital notebook in the cloud. You can insert images and pictures. It could be a way to collect information. There's an app for your iPad where you can use it. You can save notes offline, and then when you get online, it auto syncs. So if I'm on my laptop, on my iPad, or my um, mobile device, I can access the same notes. It's a great tool for students when they start taking notes and collecting um, information for their projects. Let me stop and see. Does anyone have other tools that you found great for collaboration when students get into projects? Shared whiteboard. Shared whiteboard. Shared whiteboards? Okay, very good. Well, that's it. Those are my resources for you. 
Um, I, I know I took you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour. I didn't want to give you too many examples. There's so many neat and exciting examples of project-based learning, but I found that it's more helpful just to give you one or two specific ones just to kind of uh, get used to the concept of it. Digital storytelling is a really simple way to get started with digital age project-based learning. It doesn't take that much. If you have, if your students have access to uh, a computer, whether it's a computer lab or it's a one-to-one -one environment, uh, pretty much any device that you use, the tools are available now for adding music, adding background images. One thing that I would suggest though, stay light on the technology for the first couple of projects. And then you can add some other features down the road. For example, I, I did not, we did not use video. I'm not a big fan of using video in digital storytelling projects up front because there are just too many dynamics. I mean, you can get, you can get degrees in, you know, in, in film studies and the dynamics, all of the different things for lighting and sound and um, how you set things up. You can teach that in time. But that's a lot. There are, there are a lot of complex skills to do that with excellence. So why not let them start with just small pieces? In fact, we have a graduate course that teaches, prepares graduate teachers as an online course. And we teach them about multimedia. The first unit, they have to create a message. And the only visual they can use are fonts. The only visuals they use are fonts. So they have to think about how the font does or does not represent. And they have to argue and, and defend their choices. So once they've done that small piece, then they can use a single image to communicate a single concept. Then you can begin to add the different elements. So I always encourage people, get them to start small, because you don't, the goal is not for them just to have flashy projects. It's for them to have increased reflection and intellectual discourse about the topic at hand. So that's where we want to make sure we scaffold this, just do a piece at a time. That's the biggest mistake I've seen when people do project-based learning is they try to throw every gadget in at once. Pick one or two, work with it, and then add it. All right, I'm happy to chat afterward, or if you have other questions, feel free to bring them along. I think we actually finished even a couple minutes early here. That's great. Uh, feel free to go grab a cup of coffee and a donut, or stick around and chat. Thanks.